chapter 2 as we continue excuse me, our study in Revelation. We've been looking at the letters that have been written to the seven churches there in Asia Minor. And I share with you that the letters that were written there was actually, I think the first sermon we preached was the letters to the ages. And so the letters that are written to the churches in the book of Revelation can apply to every kind of church, every different church throughout the ages. And what was true back then is still true for the church uh, uh, here today. Uh, today, the church that we're going to look at is Pergamos. That is the third church on the list that we will uh, share in. Pergamos uh, was the capital city. Was the capital city. Ma matter of fact, there was a library that had over 200,000 writings in the library there in Pergamos. It, it had many pagan temples, uh, as we've seen in, in most of these where the churches were located. They had many uh, pagan temples. Matter of fact, one of the temples that was there was to the god of medicines. Uh, and, and so, uh, actually, they would let people go into the temple if they were sick and and they had snakes in the temple that was there, and the belief was that if a snake came by and touched you, you would be healed. And, and so uh, uh, that is one of the, the temples that were there. There were many other temples. There was one built, a massive temple built to Zeus, uh, the ruler of the gods. And, and so for this church to be in the middle of all of that, uh, de uh, definitely we can see how it was needed there. The problem with this church is the first church that we find is a church that compromised. In other words, it let a lot of the world inside of the church, instead of being uh, different from the, from the world, they literally began to let things from the outside come in and affect the church. And you're going to see that, that Jesus comes and, and has the word. You and I, let me share, you and I cannot compromise our stance. Amen. We cannot compromise the word of God. We cannot compromise what we believe regardless of what the world says. Regardless of what we see on TV today, regardless of social media, we must stand firm on what we know. Uh, the times are not going to get better. The times are only going to get worse. We know that. The book of Revelation that we're going to study. As we do this, we're going to see what this world is coming to down the road. And so uh, you and I got to make a stand. We got to take a stand. And we cannot compromise. We cannot look like the world we cannot worship like the world. We are to be different than the world. And so I want to, I want to see the letter that is written by, uh, for, uh, as Christ addresses this church. And we're going to see this uh, church that was compromised. I'm going to ask you to rise to your feet. We're in Revelation chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 12 and go through verse 17. Again, this is the church at Pergamos. I have entitled it the Unfaithful Bride. You and I know that we are the bride of Christ. Here is an a, a example of the unfaithful bride that Jesus is going to deal with. Revelation 2 beginning in verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church at Pergamos, remember the angel is either this, because all seven churches, the letter was written to the angels, either angels that are over the church, protecting the church, or it's the pastor himself. Okay, and so that's how the letter was addressed. These things, saith he, which has the sharp sword... With two edges. We know the word of God is like a two-edged sword. So this is the word of God that is coming. Verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. Thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Baal, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else while I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving him that receiveth. May God add his blessing to the reader of his word, and will you bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come today to look at a compromised church. Dear Heavenly Father, in a world where People hate truth. Dear Heavenly Father, truth 
sounds like hate to those who hate truth. Dear Heavenly Father, we live in a time where truth seems to bring out the hate in people. God, what we find is offensive to people really is conviction. God, we live in a world where conviction, really, uh, people look at conviction as an offense. Dear Heavenly Father, your word is true and we can stand on your word. As we look around the world that we live in today, dear Heavenly Father, we can see why so many are in trouble. Because God, we have compromised who we are and what we stand for. God, I pray today that you would strengthen the church. That you would give the ability to stand and fight the fight of faith. To understand, dear Heavenly Father, we are more than conquerors. In Christ Jesus. Be with us. Watch over. Keep us. Forgive us. For we fail you. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When we get into, into this church, we find there, at the beginning there, in the uh, 13th verse, we literally find the position of the church. Now, I share with you that it is not your conduct, but it is your position in Christ. For you see, your conduct is never good enough. You will never be good enough because the Bible tells us that even our righteousness is like filthy rag. Oh, you might be you might be better than me, and but but the measuring stick is not your pastor when it comes to conduct. The measuring stick is always uh, uh, for for God's people. It's Jesus Christ. The measuring stick really for the world is Jesus Christ. And so when we look at our conduct, we know that we can never measure up in our conduct because it's not by your works. It's not by uh, how you act. It is literally the position that you are in. That's why the Bible teaches us that we are to be in Christ in that position rather than our good works and conduct. Now I want to look at the position. We want to start uh, today with the position of this church. We find in the, in, the, in the opening statement in verse 13 in the position of the church, we find Christ's omniscience. In other words, we find that as the description was given by John, if you remember when he was describing the one that stood in the midst, the one that stood in the midst of the churches there, he said that he had eyes like fire. And I told you that that was a penetrating look. It was an all-seeing. It was a, 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 a fire means judgment. It is, it is to be able to tell that which is right. And so Jesus Christ has these all-seeing eyes. And notice what he says there. He says, I know thy works. It is by those all-seeing eyes, the omniscience of, uh, of, of Christ knowing all things uh, that is there. Matter of fact, this is what it says in verse 13. He says, I know thy works and where thy dwellest. Even at, in Satan's seed, uh, this place was corrupt. Not, listen, not only not like uh, Smyrna, the last uh, church that we studied, it said that it was the synagogue of Satan. We find here at Pergamos is the very throne of Satan. It is the, the base of operation for Satan is literally in this place. And so we find here that as Jesus is talking about this, he says in verse 13, hold fast, I know that I'll hold fast my name and has not denied my faith, even in those days when Antipas, my faithful martyr, was slain among you where Satan uh, dwelleth. Now, notice this here. Jesus uh, repeats this uh, statement, and he does to all the seven churches there. I know thy works. Uh, uh, we know there that he is aware of the churches, just like he is aware of you and I in this place today. It's not like that Jesus Christ turned off his awareness uh, some time ago, but he literally knows you and I. He literally knows what we're doing. He literally knows the work of this church. He is aware of everything about this church. He is aware of you and me. Uh, and, and it brings us to an interesting position that he shares because he knew this church. Notice some things there. Number one in that verse, it says they're dwelling. I, I love the fact that he calls it a dwelling. I love the fact that he knows where they dwell. In verse 13, uh, uh, they dwell there. They have set up shop there. They are not traveling through. Uh, this church is planted. It has been rooted there. You and I are the evidence today of those that have been planted in this place 
in this church and days gone by they uh, they fought the fight uh, they held uh, they held true to the call of, of Jesus Christ matter of fact uh, in this I know thy dwelling place and that's what he's saying there I know thy dwelling place uh, uh, there is no chance of doubt he knows absolutely about the planted church that is there uh, he knows everything about this church uh, uh, but but notice what he says there that their dwelling place was in the middle of a hostile environment. You and I today is no different in this church. Listen, persecution may be in a different form, but you and I, we, we live in a hostile environment because the world is not going to accept Jesus Christ. The world is not going to accept the church. And so we find that Pergamos, and, and again, Jesus Christ seeing this and knowing this, that Pergamos existed in a hostile environment they worshiped in the city where Satan's seat was, uh, literally where Satan dwelt, uh, Satan sitting in the idea there on a throne that was there. Uh, Pergamos was a stronghold for Satan. Remember how I told you that the, the kind of uh, example of that is that anytime we open the door for Satan and he can stick his foot in, uh, you can't close the door when a foot's in the door there. And, and so that's a, a foothold. The Bible talks about a foothold. Some of us in our lives, we've done things in our lives that give Satan a little foothold in our life. Now, if you don't do something about that foothold, what happens? It becomes a stronghold. You become bound by the things of Satan, whether it's the thought process of our mind or in the environment that we're in or whatever the case may be there. I want you to know that this church here is in the middle of what Satan has a stronghold. It's not just a little presence here, but Satan literally has a stranglehold on the city there, the capital city uh, there that this church is a part of. However, they dwell there. This church uh, uh, has decided to stay put in the middle of this stronghold. There are a lot of people today that think that Satan is just a figment of man's imagination. Uh, maybe it's some cartoon character, a, a little red man with some horns and a pointed tail and a, and a pitchfork. There are some that think that he's nothing more than a, ca a cartoon character in a fairy tale. Listen, can I share that Satan is very real. Satan, uh, was, we know that Satan and, and Jesus Christ had that 40 days in the wilderness there. Uh, Jesus Christ knows that Satan is real. He's very real. And not only is he real, but man, just stop and look around in the world that we're in today. And, and, and it's not just that Satan has a stronghold in one place. Satan literally has a stronghold of uh, in this world. And, uh, and listen, he is, he, is, he is working in our world today. Matter of fact, it carries me back to a scripture that we find in the Old Testament time. There was a man named Job. And in the book of Job, in chapter 1 and verse 7, this is what it says. When, 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 uh, when God looks at Satan and he asks the question, what are you doing? This is exactly what Satan said. He said, I am going to and fro in the earth. I say that again. I'm going to and fro in the earth. He is literally going all over the earth. And from walking up and down in it, he said. Matter of fact, he said, he said, I'm seeking, I'm looking. The Bible later on tells us that the, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The Bible refers to him as the God of this world. The prince of the power of the air. Never be deceived, my friends, that Satan is at work. He wants nothing more than to destroy the lives and the testimony of every Christian that he can I, I'm telling you, Jesus seen that. Jesus warned of that. Jesus told his apostles that. And here we find the church, the influence from the outside, uh, sitting there being planted at Pergamos in this hostile environment that they're, they were in is no different than the hostile environment that you and I deal with uh, today. Now notice this. He said, not only do I know your dwelling place, in verse 13, he also goes in, uh, goes on to say this, I know uh, your doctrine. I know the, the doctrine. So he knew their doctrine that was there. He said, and thou holdest fast my name. Here's what I want you to understand. You say, well, ain't that a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing. The problem is, is that in the church at Pergamos, Jesus' name was just like all the other gods that was there. Jesus was just one of, of many names. And all 
you remember when, when, when Paul got to Athens over there and, and they had all the idols that was built and there was one to the unknown God in case they had missed one? Well, it's no different here. Listen, now, yeah, there were those in the church that held fast to his name, but there were also those in the church that, uh, that held to all names, all the idols of that day and time. And so in the midst of the evil, they did hold fast to the name of Jesus and they did have faith in him uh, as far as a remnant within the church. There were those who were doing it right. There were those that was worshiping the way that they should. There were those uh, who had turned away from the false idols that were there. But there were some in the church that were still doing it. Like I said, to most uh, in Pergamos, Jesus was just one of many gods. Uh, uh, but, but, but here's the thing for uh, those uh, that were true believers in the church. They knew that Jesus was the name above every name. And they knew that by this name, by this one, that man, that was the only way for man to be saved. Matter of fact, you and I today, we didn't come here. Listen, I've shared this with you, that my preaching is not the most important thing. And however, the word of God is, is the most important. It's not me. It's not how I preach. It's not the words I say. But it is literally that you and I come today and we worship him and we get in his presence and we allow the spirit to move in us and we worship and we cry out to a holy God that loves us. That's why we are gathered here today. It is because of Jesus Christ that we are gathered here today. Jesus is the reason why we are here. It is his precious name. For you see, there is no name in heaven and earth like the name of Jesus Christ. We've met here to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. We've met here to praise the name of Jesus Christ. Can I put it this way? The world needs to hear the blessed name of Jesus. They need to hear it sung. They need to hear it preached about. They need to hear it testified of. The world needs to know and hear the name of Jesus Christ. And so, he says this to the church that is there. You have not denied my faith. Not only his name, but there were some there in the church that it had held fast to their faith. And listen, there are fundamental truths that are taught by the Bible. There are fundamental truths taught by the Word of God that you and I cannot abandon. I don't care what science says. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what your friends on Facebook says. I'm telling you, there are things that you and I must not deny, and we must hold on to the faith, uh, the truth that is there. The things like, number one, the virgin birth. Number two, the, sub, uh, the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Number three, his bodily resurrection. Number four, his literal second coming. Number five, the inerrancy of Scripture. No matter how much the world denies the precious truth, we must hold fast to them, for without them our faith is in vain. It is what makes Jesus different than anyone else. So he says there, I know your dwelling. Listen, church, he knows our dwelling today. He says, I know your doctrine. Now, he knows what they believe and how they held fast to the name. Those who did and those who didn't. He also knows the third thing here, their devotion. Uh, he says this, he said, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, still in verse 13 there, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. Uh, uh, think about this, Jesus Christ literally names a martyr. Jesus, I, I'm pretty sure for Antipas, we don't know a lot about Antipas other than let me just share a few things that tradition says. That Antipas was a preacher there in Pergamos and they didn't like what he was preaching and so they literally got him and they took him because of all the idols that was there. They locked him inside of a golden calf. It kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? A golden calf, that's what the children of Israel had worshipped at the foot of the mountain. And so they take uh, Antipas and they put him in a golden calf, a uh, cow there, and, and they literally build a fire under this golden calf and they literally just bake him to death and shine. Remember I told you that in the persecution in the times of the church there were things like they would boil them in oil that had happened to John before he goes to the island of Patmos. 
They would boil them in oil. They would burn them at the stake like at Polycarp at that Smyrna uh, that happened to him that was there. They would burn them at the stake. They would put them in arenas and fight against beasts. They would put animal uh, fur on them so that wild dogs would attack them. There was a lot of ruthless... Uh, did, do you understand that there was a lot of Christians who were, uh, who were facing this kind of persecution in this day? And Antipas was one of those who had faced this persecution I, I just imagine in, in, in reading this that Jesus Christ is telling you and I uh, what he would tell to you was, well done, my good and faithful servant, uh, as he was uh, just literally uh, a cook there inside of that, of that idol that was there. And so he says, I know your devotion. Uh, how would we stand in the face of death? How would we stand in, uh, in a time of persecution uh, uh, like they were being boiled in oil and burned at the stake? Remember, Polycarp literally said they wanted to nail him, and he said, no, I'll just hold on. Uh, go ahead and build your fire. I'll, I'll hold on here as they uh, prepare to burn him at the stake. Uh, we say that we're committed to Jesus, but are we really? That's a great question that we must ask. In, in light of what Jesus shares about this one, he calls Antipas out by name. He, he shares about, calls him my faithful, I love that, my faithful martyr who was slain among you. Antipas was faithful. By, by the way, Antipas, the name Antipas, anti means against, pos means all. And so literally his name was against all. And I, I, I just, I, listen, he stood against all that Satan brought and he paid a heavy price for that. He refused. Here's what they were doing in that day. They wanted everybody. There was three idols that were built to Caesar and literally in Pergamos, they wanted all the people to proclaim that Caesar was God. And so Antipas, was against them all. He refused to proclaim uh, Caesar as God. And then uh, because of that, placed in that brass bowl or go bowl that was there, and that fire roasted him alive. Church, can I share that? That is devotion to Jesus Christ. That's what it looked like. He did not die in vain. How do I know? Because Jesus literally calls him out by name. Listen, I don't want to preach doom and gloom. I, I, I don't want to do that. But I'm telling you that persecution is coming to America. Persecution is coming to the church. It's already happening in other places. We see it on the other side of the world. We even see it in our next door neighbor, neighbors in Canada where preachers uh, uh, who preach against sin are, 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 are being arrested. I, I saw a story the other day where they're telling them what they can preach. I'm telling you, persecution is coming. The Bible says there's coming a time like has never been seen before, even, uh, even uh, uh, worse than the days of Noah. It's coming. Notice, though, what he says to this church. When he, he, he gives this position of the church, the second thing that he does as he comes back and he begins to name the problems of, of the church. Hey, all churches has got problems we got problems because it's made up of imperfect people. Uh, listen, no church out there is a perfect church. Uh, if, it was a, if it was a perfect church, you and I could not attend it. We have a perfect God, no doubt. But the church, because of the people inside of the church, there's always going to be problems inside of the church. No different here. We pick up in verse 14. He says, but I have a few things. If you remember the first church, he said this. He said, I have one thing against you. You lost your first love. Notice here there are a few things. There's more than one thing that he has here, this problem that he had. I have a few things against thee. Some were true Christians. Some were doing what they were supposed to, but not all. Notice the, notice the problem of the church that is there. Here's where we get to the problem where sometimes the church tries to look like the world. Notice this. He says. Here's our compromise. Verse 14. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou. Because thou hast there them. Them in the church. That hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. Before the children of, it, uh, of, 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 of Israel. We know this. Uh, we know that. Uh, all, all this is, Balaam and Balak was really this, that, 
that he, he, he was supposed to go and curse and he couldn't and he ended up blessing the church. But he literally told him to do this. He told him to get them to do idolatry worship. And, and so if we, if we could get them to do idolatry worship, then... And that's exactly what is happening in this day and time. There were those in the church who wanted Jesus and something else. They wanted Jesus and Zeus. They wanted Jesus and someone, uh, some other God that was there. And so uh, the, the faithful were doing the work of Christ, but they had allowed within the church uh, some among them who were, not, uh, who were not the true church. and the, the, They were mixing with those who taught these false doctrines. Who taught these false doctrines. Matter of fact, I have heard many in, the, in society today, and I pray you don't ever have this attitude. I, I've heard people say, man, we just got to do whatever it takes to get people in the doors. You better be careful when you say that. We, we just, we got to do whatever it takes. And see, when we have whatever it takes mindset, here's what happens. We begin to lower the standard for the sake of numbers. I, I'm telling you, I, I see this in the military now. They're beginning to ease up on some of their standards. I, I, I began to see it in the, in the sports. I, I began to see it in the corporate world. I, I, I began to see in the society that we live in, in order not to offend someone, we've taken the standards that was once high standards, and we've uh, began to allow those standards to decrease. Think about that. Because I will share with you that a compromising church will be soon filled with a bunch of lost people when you lower the standards who have a false sense of security. Listen, I'm not against lost people. We're always lost people. What I'm against is taking God's standard and lowering God's standard so that that which is God looks like the world so that we don't offend anyone and we give them the false sense of security while they're still on their way to hell. That's exactly where this church was. They had the sense of security while they worshiped false idols uh, they had this, this sense of security there uh, and this compromised position as they're on their way to hell. It is literally, listen, when you compromise, can I share it this way? When you compromise, it will always bring corruption. Their corruption is found in this verse 14, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast them that hold the doctrine. They have gotten away from the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to, to cast a stumbling block uh, before the children of Israel to, to do what? To eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. That's what was happening in the church. It was no different than what was happening on the outside. Corruption will soon follow compromise. It won't be long until the ways of God are abandoned when they begin to soften, when they begin to compromise this way. Uh, when we, uh, as men, abandon the ways of God, literally Jesus warns them of doing this. Jesus has warned them of this doctrine of, of Balaam. Uh, listen, Satan, it, it was tried. Listen, here's the, here's the thing. Here, I want you to understand where we are in the world today. I want you to understand the plans of Satan and how the plans of Satan is against the church. And, uh, I want you to understand that, that why the world is in the chaos that it's in today. When we look and we see and people say, well, there's violence on the street. Do you understand that Satan? Do you understand that, that, when, with, that with, with violence comes allegiance? Again, I'm not here to preach to bloom, uh, gloom and doom, but I'm telling you what Jesus, looking at this church, and says, listen, violence, when you use violence, what it does, it breaks the will of people. Violence gets people where they align. Uh, there is an allegiance. See, uh, Caesar would have someone's head cut off if there was an allegiance uh, to, to Caesar. And so, listen, whether it was false or real, they literally showed their allegiance to Caesar because they didn't want to die. I'll give you even another example of that. There was a man named Peter who was afraid of dying who denied Jesus Christ three times because he was afraid of death. His allegiance didn't belong to Jesus Christ on that day. His allegiance were to those who had threatened violence against him. 
He literally was warming him hand, his hands with the, with the enemy that day. He became like one of them. Because violence brings allegiance. That's what Satan, that's why Satan loves to use violence. That's why the world seems to be so violent. Uh, so violent. This doctrine, uh, this doctrine that we see of Balaam is alive and well in churches today. Many want the pleasures of sin through the week and God on Sunday. We can't have it both ways. The Bible says that man cannot serve two masters. You can't live like the devil among the world and be right with God. Jesus comes later on in, that, in verse 15 and he talks about the Nicolaitans and holding the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that were there. We know they were doing false teaching. We know they had a hierarchy there. And so one was above another that was there. Hey, look, can, can I share this with you? They had elevated men into the position of the levels reserved for God. I'm not against religion. But I mean, listen, it's not preachers or popes or anything that's above Jesus Christ. We're all sinners saved by grace. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. We all need Jesus. It is Jesus Christ and nothing else. It's not Jesus and the right church. It's not Jesus and the right preacher. It's not Jesus and where you live. It's not Jesus in your country. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. And when you take that and you compromise that and you put the world in the middle of that, you're no longer following Jesus. You're following Jesus and something else. This church was doing that. This corruption because of the compromise. Look at their confrontation. He comes back in 16 and he says this. He says, repent or else I will come quickly. And notice what he says. He says, and we'll fight against them. Those that were in the church. Listen, don't think that God doesn't know. Don't think that God doesn't know your life. He literally says, I will fight against them. Those in the church that had compromised with the sword of my mind. Listen, Jesus gives a solemn, a solemn warning to Pergamos. It is a warning. It is consequences. There is going to be swift consequences. Consequences. He wasn't going to fight against the whole church. That's not what he says. But I'll tell you what he said. I'm going to pick, I'm going to find those. I'm going, to, I'm going to pick out those troublemakers. I'm going to get those that are causing trouble. Notice the and and them in that verse 16. Jesus gives a solemn warning to you and I today, to the world out there today, that we are to repent. Repent is to change our minds, to turn up, to, to, to turn around, to live a different way, to think differently about our life, uh, uh, because there are consequences. Uh, listen, I, I I shared not too long ago with a guy, and he was like, he was a, he was an evolutionist, and and he told me he didn't believe, he didn't believe in God, and he didn't believe in all that, and he didn't believe in Jesus. And, you know, and I, and I tell him, I said, look, I said, let's just say for the sake that you're right. I don't believe that you're right. I think I've got enough evidence to back up that Jesus is real. But let's just say that you're right. If you are right and there's no Jesus, there's no heaven and hell, then let me just share this with you. I've, I've lived a good life. I've tried to live a good moral life. I've tried to treat people right. And, and if there's no heaven and hell, I die and that's the end of my life. If you're right, that's, that's, that's where we are. But I looked at him and I told him this. I said, but if I'm right, brother, you've got a problem. If I'm right, there is a God. And if I'm right, there is a Jesus. And, and I know that I'm right. I have the, the, the inspiration of God, the word of God, the, the biblical truth. I have changed lives uh, that we see. We have the evidence and the testimony of people's lives who have been changed. We have martyrs. We have apostles who give their life, who died for the cause of Jesus Christ. Uh, they didn't take Jesus lightly. They, they believed in who he was. We have the eyewitness account of, of an empty tomb. We have an eyewitness account of Jesus Christ being crucified and raised from the dead. We have, we have uh, the, the, the apostles who had talked to Jesus Christ after his death. We have over 400 that, that the Bible says, Paul says there was over 400 that had shared with him. He said, you go in Paul's life, you go and ask them who talked to Jesus Christ. I have the evidence on my side. And, and listen, and, and because I am right, there is a Jesus. If you don't believe that, you got a problem. There's trouble that's coming. Jesus says, repent. Repent. Do you know why? Because God knows those who belong to him. He knows the one who operates as wolves devouring the sheep. 
He knows the one. Listen, I, I, I don't want Jesus to find me being a troublemaker in the church. I don't want Jesus finding me going against the teachings of Jesus Christ. Uh, listen, I believe all churches have those. Uh, listen, and they may go unnoticed to the eyes of the people, but I'm telling you, Jesus will care for his bride. Amen. Jesus will take care of his bride. So we see the corruption of the church. Jesus called them out on this corruption. The third thing and the final thing is this is the provision that is there. We're about to wrap up. Hang on here. The provision uh, of the church. Look at verse 17. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give unto him hidden manna. I love this. Hey, God says to them, hey, I'm going to give you a hidden manna. Let's think about that. Why would... Why would the word of God, and why would Jesus Christ in the letters to the churches say this about hidden manna? You and I know this, man. Manna was a sustaining thing of life. Manna is what gave life to the children of Israel in the Old Testament time. We know all about the manna and the wilderness. We know it was literally God's provision. That literally God kept them alive. God's provision was there. Listen, and it's, I love this because... They had, what did he say? They were trying to get them to offer up foods to the idols that was there. God is saying this. I, I don't want you to offer up uh, food to a, to, a, to a pagan idol. I'm about to give you some heavenly food. I'm about to give you a, a, a food. Listen, Jesus Christ said, I am the bread. Matter of fact, when we do the Lord's Supper, I always share this. That, that is in John uh, chapter 6, verses 57 through 58. It says, this is the bread which came down out of heaven. Talking about the Old Testament time, this is the bread that came down out of heaven, which your, which your forefathers, your fathers did eat, and they died when they ate this bread. But Jesus said, this bread that I give unto you, why? Because he is the bread of life. And as your fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread, he said, shall live forever. Here he tells the church, I, I, I am a God of provision. I am a God of life. I am a God of heavenly food. You don't have to give it to the pagans that are there, but partake of the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. Most in Pergamos fill themselves with worldly pleasure. It was all about the lust of the flesh. It was about the lust of the eye, the pride of life that was there. And so, uh, the, the, listen, uh, here's what he's saying. That even though most of in Pergamos had filled themselves with worldly pleasure, the pure was not left out. Jesus would feed them with his abundance, with his abundant life. He wasn't going to forget about his brothers. See, what Jesus offers is always superior to what the world has to offer. And so by sharing this, he says, I've got more to offer. Than anything. Listen, when we can come to the Lord's table and find nourishment for, listen, not for our bodies, but for our soul. Think about that. He who eats this bread shall live forever. Yeah. Then the other thing he says in that verse was he's going to give them a white stone. Now you and I don't understand that, but let me share a little bit. A little bit about a white stone. Just some things that was white stones was given for. Listen, a white stone may be a little value to us. A white stone didn't didn't bring no excitement to us. But a white stone was a precious gift during this time. For you see, when a, a person went before the court and the judges and the court system judged him, they had two stones. They had a black stone and a white stone. So if a judge would vote a man guilty, he would vote with a black stone. But if he voted a man innocent, he would vote with a white stone. That in itself would be a wonderful thing because Jesus said, I just give you a white stone. You are, you are innocent of your crimes. To that band of, of true bride of Christ. The ones that weren't an unfaithful bride, but the truly true church. Soldiers, after they had won a victory in battle, they were given a white stone. Matter of fact, not only that, but a white stone would be used and broken into pieces and it would be shared among friends so that any time that you, need, you needed help, any time you needed your friend's help, 
You literally had a broken stone given by your friend that you could cash in in a time of need. Matter of fact, for the victors who had won a race, a victory, we, we give trophies today, but back then, the ones who had won a race, they would give them this stone, and this stone would have their name etched on it, and, and it was literally like a ticket for all the festivities and all the things that would happen after the race uh, that was the party for the winners. They literally were able to get their entrance into, the, into these festivities because they had a white stone with their name on it that said they were the winners. They were given tickets as tickets to other special occasions, maybe to the Colosseum or some special thing within the city. Your name would be put upon it. It would be given to you. And when you went to some other festivity, some other thing, that was your ticket to get in. Matter of fact, a groom many times would offer a white stone as a promise. I guess we call them promise rings, engagement rings today that we give. Back in that time, they would give a white stone. Their names written on it. It was a promise that this groom was going to take a bride, uh, that, that she was going to be his bride. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God's given us a white stone. I, I think about the white stones where the Ten Commandments was written on. But more importantly than that, I think about what the Bible says right here. What Jesus shares about these white stones. Let's read it together in verse 17. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. What is he? A God of provision, a God of life. And he will give him a white stone. And in the stone, listen to this, a new name. A new name. A new name. Aren't you glad for your new name? I don't know, when kids grow up in school, uh, sometimes they have nicknames and sometimes they have names that hurt. Sometimes the nicknames are not good names. We go around and we say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But the truth of it is, sometimes names do. But thank God, he gives us a new name. In other words, you see, I'm no longer the man I used to be. He gave me a new name. Jesus has given me a new name, and, and here's what the name is. It belongs to him. I belong to him. See, a new name speaks out of an individual's relationship with Jesus. That's what he's saying. I've given you a relationship with me, church. I've, I, I've given you the stone like a groom to a bride. You belong to me. I've given you a new name. Matter of fact, here's how the Bible puts it. That you have a new name and it is recorded in the Lamb's book of life. What is that name? I belong to Jesus. I am an heir to the kingdom. I am I am a child of God. In other words, every because we have this new name, every child of God shares an intimate relationship with Christ. Will I be known as I'm known in heaven? Absolutely. But my name is this. Can I listen? If if it was when you marry, you change your last name. Hey, how about it? My my my, my name has been changed to Jesus Christ. I'm a child of of the king. On my birth certificate, my heavenly birth certificate, my father God's name is on my birth certificate. I am adopted. I am adopted. I have a new name. I belong to him. And this is exactly, listen, what he's telling to you and I, church. Listen, be victorious. There's a white stone that is there. Be the soldier that wins the victory in battle. There's a white stone that is there. 
Uh, listen, uh, there, a special occasion is coming, uh, the return of Christ and, and, and us going home. There is a white stone that has been given to you there. Listen, there are white stones uh, that he's promised to take us as a ride. That white stone has been given uh, there. I pray today that you have received the blood and the power and the love of Jesus Christ. Because if not, there's consequences. He shares with all of us, I know your works. I know your location. I know your dwelling. I know your doctrine, what you believe. I know your devotion. I, 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 I see some compromise in your life. Compromise leads to corruption. When there is corruption, there's confrontation with Jesus Christ. But yet he comes with a provision today. And if you don't know him as your savior, I'm telling you the blood of Christ is available. If he's calling you today, you come, you bow down in an altar, you cry out to a holy God. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. It ain't nothing else but Jesus Christ. You come to Jesus today because he has a name. He has a name that he wants to give you a new name. If you'll come and share today. Church, we cannot compromise. We've got to stand even in the throne where there's the throne of the devil around us on all sides. We must stand and never, ever compromise. We're going to come now where you can come to this altar and you can pray. I want you to come today. And if there's been a compromise in your life, come, repent. If you need strength today, come, repent. If you're in the middle of one of the biggest storms in your life, understand it's the devil that's causing the, the, the fight, causing the, the trouble in your life, trying to get allegiance by violence, by the thought process. Whatever the case may be, your environment, you come today and you kneel down. There's repentance, there's mercies, there's grace. God is standing here with arms open wide that you come today. Don't compromise. Stand your ground. He has a white stone. Be faithful, bride. Be faithful. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we could come and share. God has